Hello everyone, this is uh, uh, Gustavo Zaposnik. I'm uh, the uh, editor in chief of the World Stroke Academy. For the World Stroke Organization, this is part of the uh, series of uh, podcasts and uh, uh, teleconference or videos that we are pro, uh, 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 doing from uh, the WSA to uh, highlight some of the uh, fantastic work done from some of our colleagues. In this opportunity, this is the second paper of SWIFT Direct that published in Lancet uh, 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 a few uh, uh, weeks ago. And uh, we, this is the continuation. We interview first uh, Dr. Bernard Yan, the first author. Uh, and now we are uh, interviewing uh, Dr. Urs uh, uh, Fischer, who is uh, the uh, lead author of SWIFT uh, Direct. And I can share actually the uh, screen of uh, uh, SWIFT Direct uh, uh, when he started. Uh, speaking. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Urs, he's a friend, colleague, and uh, uh, in my view, a visionary in what is going to happen in a stroke uh, care, uh, especially acute stroke care and reperfusion therapies in the next uh, 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 decade. So Urs, uh, he is the uh, chair of the Department of uh, uh, Neurology in uh, Basel, Switzerland, he moved from the University of Bern and now becoming the chair of the department and empower uh, young visionary. So welcome, uh, uh, Urs. Nice having you. Yeah, thank you very much, Gustavo. And thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Uh, it's always a pleasure having uh, uh, the opportunity to, you know, uh, have a discussion with you. And I'm sharing essentially the your publication. Uh, about uh, 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 Swift uh, Direct. So tell us in, in a nutshell, so what were the results essentially? Yeah, thank you very much. So the big question is, um, should we treat patients with an acute large vessel occlusion? Should we combine intravenous thrombolysis plus endovascular therapy or is direct mechanical thrombectomy equally effective as the combination of intravenous thrombolysis? and endovascular therapy. And I think we have to go a little bit back in the history of strokeology. And we all know that uh, almost more now 30 years ago, intravenous thrombolysis has been established as the first evidence-based reperfusion strategy in acute ischemic stroke. Later on, after 2013, several randomized controlled trials have shown that endovascular therapy is highly effective in patients with large vessel occlusion, especially with internal carotid artery occlusion, proximal and uh, middle cell artery occlusion. However, given the fact that intravenous thrombolysis was the standard of care, all these trials have compared IVTP eligible patients together with a bridging thrombolysis. And for patients who had a contraindication, they were just performing mechanical thrombectomy alone. However, we do not know if intravenous eligible patients who are treated with direct mechanical thrombectomy have an equal result as patients receiving bridging thrombolysis. And that was the rationale of the SWIFT direct trial. So therefore, we randomized 408 patients in 48 sites in Europe and Canada and it is important to notice that we only randomized so-called mothership patients, which means patients with immediate access to the endovascular therapy. We were not randomizing patients in the so-called trip and ship scenario, which means they're coming to a small hospital and then they are going to the thrombectomy center. And what we could show is that direct mechanical thrombectomy is not non-inferior bridging thrombolysis. So what does it mean for uh, the population? This means that currently there is no reason to skip TPA in IVTPA eligible patients uh, in the acute setting of an LVO. Thank you, Urs, that's, uh, that's great and very insightful. Uh, then the, the question is, most of previous trials shows a reperfusion rate of approximately 75 to 80% or reperfusion, recanalization, I'm using interchangeable, although it's not the same, we know. The question is, how were you able to achieve 91 and 96% in each group? So tell me, where is the magic there? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, we also were 
uh, uh, surprised by the results, the excellent reperfusion rates. And I think it's important to highlight that we had an independent core lab. So we were not measuring the reperfusion rates ourselves. So this was an independent core lab who evaluated all the images of the patients treated in the SWIFT direct trial. And uh, the, one of the potential reasons is I think the techniques have evolved uh, over the last uh, five to 10 years. Furthermore, we strongly encouraged our interventionalists to use proximal protection devices, which means balloon guided catheter or distal aspiration uh, catheter during the thrombectomy. And last but not least, it was mandatory to use dent retrievers. So Swift Direct was focusing on combination therapies of stent retrievers plus, whenever possible, proximal uh, protection devices. And I think that is one factor of the high reperfusion rates in these trials. And last but not least, um, we always encouraged um, people to give the full dose of TPA in patients who were in the bridging arm. So, you know, sometimes people stop the TPA when they perform the groin puncture or when they have a successful reperfusion. However, we said to people, listen, we do want to see the full effect of TPA. And potentially this was also one of the major driver. Thank you, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And thank you for clarifying. And uh, uh, one more question is that sometimes people don't pay too much attention, but as, a, as clinicians, there is an important number there is you reported also that 70% or 7% of people who had no recanalization or reperfusion only achieve independency. This is a very important number, which means that, you know, what happened with those people who do not achieve reperfusion? So essentially non-responders, if you want to call that way. And was there any difference between both arms? So those who did not reperfuse with the EBT or thrombolit, uh, thromb, uh, thrombectomy alone versus the uh, uh, combined or rich therapy? No, there was a clear uh, effect both treatment arms. If you have a poor vessel uh, reperfusion, uh, then the chances of get independence is poor in both treatment arms. Surprisingly, the risk, uh, the risk or the, the difference in rates of symptomatic were not different in the both treatment arms. And this right. was for me one of the big surprises. And uh, this is probably also uh, related, first of all, to the perturbation selection. Now we do nowadays. And a second also to, due to the fact that we had a very high reperfusion rates, because what we observe is that risk of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage is increased if you do not have sufficient reperfusion. Thank you, uh, Urs. That's a very uh, uh, thoughtful answer. And finally, uh, you know, um, most people would like to see what you envision that is going to happen in the strong world, especially for reperfusion therapies or uh, hyperacute therapies in the next five or 10 years. You gave a nice introduction about where we started and where we are. So what do you think is going to happen in the next five or 10 years? I think before we start to talk about the future, I have to challenge a bit with the present. Okay. And I think we have to make an experiment. So think about what would have happened if endovascular therapy would have been the first evidence-based proven stroke reperfusion therapy, and if intravenous thrombolysis would have been proven afterwards, what would we have done? We would now have done a trial adding intravenous thrombolysis on top of endovascular therapy. And what would have happened? Endovascular therapy plus intravenous thrombolysis is not superior to direct mechanical thrombectomy alone. Even so, in uh, SWIFT Direct, we had the point estimate in favor of, uh, of uh, the bridging approach. This was not statistically significant, even though the trial was not powered and designed to answer this question. However, as a regulator, you would probably not add TPA on top of endovascular therapy nowadays. So this is something which you really have to consider. So coming to your question, where are we going to? And I think one of the most relevant questions is, when should we give lytics in the process of endovascular therapy? 
the whole concept of giving it before is before because you think you can improve pre-interventional reperfusion. And the rates of pre-interventional reperfusion in, uh, in Swift Direct were very low. Nevertheless, I think the big question now is, should we give TPA before, during, or after endovascular therapy? And this is important to know that in the SWIFT direct trial, TPA was running in most of the patients during the intervention. And this might also be one of the key factors why the reperfusion was so good. But now we have to think, what are we going to do in case we have an incomplete reperfusion at the end of the procedure? And therefore the question is coming up, should we give some intrauterolytics in cases of incomplete reperfusion. And you all know that there has been the CHOICE trial, which has been published in the JAMA um, some uh, months ago. And we are currently launching the so-called TECHNO trial, which means intrauterial connected place in patients with incomplete reperfusion on top of the current standard therapy. That means on top of direct mechanical strength from vectomy and or bridging thrombolysis. So these are the next steps which we have to address. And last but not least, we are not the only ones who have performed these uh, trials on uh, comparing direct mechanical thrombectomy with bridging thrombolysis. And we are now currently collecting all these data together and we are performing uh, in, real, in real patient data meta-analysis in order to see whether there are subgroups of patients who have a benefit of direct mechanical thrombectomy and whether there are subgroups who have a benefit of the bridging approach. And for the future, eventually, we will have precision therapy or individualized therapies where we really can target our treatment. So for instance, if a patient is at risk of having a high bleeding complication, this might be a patient where we skip TPA and perform direct mechanical thrombectomy Whereas in another young, healthy patient, we can give bridging thrombolysis without any further concerns. Thank you, Urs. That's uh, very insightful. And uh, the same comment made by uh, Bernard about the, we are looking forward to the uh, patient level uh, pool analysis. So that will be very uh, uh, helpful, especially in the light of the result of the meta-analysis publishing uh, by Jose Villar and uh, Fernando Testa in Neurology. Thank you very much again for your uh, uh, support and congratulations again for the uh, uh, hard work and uh, publication. Uh, very impressive. Congrats. Thank you very much for having me. All the best.